Hi, and uh, welcome everyone to this session on Stumbling Over State by Daniel Steinberg. Uh, we're so glad you could join us today, Daniel. Thank you so much for being here. And without any further ado, over to you, Daniel. Thank you. So often when we have these concepts that we think we know so well, we forget what it's like not to know this thing. We get so comfortable with functional programming or monads or whatever. And so I think back to learning a bicycle and what it took to learn it the first time and someone helping us and running along beside us. Uh, we forget when we ride a bicycle, we think we're just steering straight, but we're actually making constant adjustments. And we forget all of these things that we do to make this thing stay up and ride and just do the things natural. Now we get on a bike and we just go where we want to go. We forget what it's like not to know how to ride a bike. And it turns out once we can ride a bike, we can pretty much ride any bike. It takes very little for us to learn shift or not shift or handbrakes or coaster brakes or electric or traditional. And so we forget what it's like not to know something and that includes functional programming. And so as we try to explain it to others, we have to put ourselves in their mindset. I remember very well coming to functional programming six, seven years ago and so many people were very helpful, but so many people were very, well, just figure it out. Just look at the code and figure it out. So I do want to note that I probably know less about functional programming than, than any of you. And these are the thoughts on my journey here and how we can help others follow along uh, with us. So I work in, in iOS. I, I teach a lot of iOS. I, I code a lot of iOS. And so our local gatherings are called Cocoa Heads. And at a recent Cocoa Heads, one of the attendees asked if we can give an example of where we might use uh, generics. And their question was just so general that I was afraid it would be dismissed by the group. And yet the group was so kind. And so my answer was the answer that was probably given to me when I asked something similar. And that was in Swift, and my examples will be in Swift. Um, so hopefully you can translate into the language you're comfortable in you can't create an array. You have to create an array of something, an array of ints, for example. And so we can create an array of ints, and then we can do something with that array of ints. We can ask how many ints there are in that collection, and we could create a, an array of bicycles, however we do that. And we can also ask our bicycles, how many bikes are there? So whether it was an array of, of ints, an array of bicycles, we can ask these common questions but what the array contained, that's what our generic is, is uh, describing to us. And so count didn't care what it contained. On the other hand, we have these higher order functions, these, these things like filter, which say, you give me an array of ints and I'll tell you which ones stay in. And here, I'm just gonna keep the ones in that are, that are multiples of two, the even ones. And for bikes, maybe I'll say, I just want to keep all bikes in who are less than $300 to buy. And in each case, we've used the type. So the collection of ints used a function that took an int. And the, we write it really with these square brackets more commonly. And this collection of bicycles used a, a function from bicycle. So this was the answer we gave her and other Coco heads chimed in and they gave a network example and a parsing example, you know, where F was, was generic and A and, and we parsed the data into something of type A and someone demoed code. And what was notable to me was the person who demoed code had never spoken in a user group ever. And they were just so astounded that they could share something with people. And it was just such a great feeling for them. No one said functor. No one said monad, and no one made fun of anybody. We ran beside the person that asked the question, well, they learned to ride a bike, and we supported them, and then we let go, and we let them ride by themselves. When they fell, and we all fall, we rushed back over and helped them get back on the bike and, and sent them on their way. And so I, I just want to urge you as we go through this material not to forget what it was like not to know, because once we know what a generic is, it just seems natural to us. So as we try to explain to others, that's what I want you to keep in your mind. Now we're remote this year, but a number of years ago, I was lucky enough to be at FunkConf in Bangalore. And at the end of the day, a few of us decided we were gonna to go to dinner. And dinner was over there. 
it was across the road in Bangalore traffic. And me being new to this, all I could see was this expanse of water with sharks and alligators in it. And I had no idea how we were going to cross. But one of our hosts, they saw that if we stepped off the curve and we walked with confidence, we could clearly walk through this. And so having that person to guide you, to give you the confidence to take that step, and then to take that step with you, that's the help that I needed to get across the street. Now, for me, I came to programming late. My training is as a mathematician. And so uh, I was self-taught. I wanted to learn some things in Java and then Objective-C. And then I came to Swift and, and other languages in between. But primarily, I was a, a mathematician. I was a differential geometer. And one of the things you do to, to make a living in, in mathematics is you teach a lot of freshman calculus classes. And so when we teach calculus, I remember the first day I walked in, this is what was written on the board in the class that I took. And I vowed I would never do that to students. It's true. It's the definition of a function. It says for every X, there's a unique Y such that F of X is Y. But that's not helpful. That's the way of getting people to say, I wonder what they're teaching down the hall. A typical calculus class begins with limits. And you talk about limits from the left and limits from the right. And if the limit from the left equals a limit from the right, then the limit exists. We talk about continuity. If the limit from the left equals the limit from the right and they equal the value of the function, then the function is continuous at that point. And then we use these definitions, this definition of derivative and this definition of limits, we use these to calculate derivatives. And the whole time we're doing that, there's someone in the back of the class thinking, this is stupid. I've taken calculus before. I know what's coming. And they tell the people around them, don't worry about it. There's an easier way. There's a formula for this. You don't have to know about limits. You don't have to know about continuity. And so as a teacher, I asked, what if we start with the easy way? I'm not saying don't teach limits. I'm not saying don't teach continuity. Just start with the formula. Use it to motivate some examples. Use these concrete cases to give people context. And then we break out of the context when we need to. Turns out calculus is built on just a few important ideas. And one is that the graph of a function is a smooth curve near some value of x. If that's the case, something like this, that's me drawing a smooth curve. So you can see near x naught that that red graph, the y equals f of x graph, is supposed to be a smooth curve, whatever smooth curve means. But if that's the case, then it turns out we can approximate the graph of the function near x with the graph of the tangent line. And so what we're saying is close up, that purple line looks something like that red curve, at least really close to x naught. And so near there, since it's so much easier to understand what's going on on the line than on a curve, we can approximate what's going on on the curve by looking at the line. And that was the idea of the derivative. The derivative is the slope of this tangent line. So the derivative of f at x naught, that's the slope of the tangent line, whatever the y-intercept happens to be. So that is our first very simple idea in calculus, and we use it for all sorts of things. There's special things that happen when the derivative is zero. There's special things that happen when things are increasing or decreasing. But if we have a smooth curve, now that word smooth curve means something, and there's details that we're kind of leaving out for now that we're going to have to come back to later because it turns out not all curves are smooth. For instance, we quickly encounter the absolute value of x. And if we look at the absolute value of x, we see there's a corner there at the origin. And it turns out then that this smooth curve thing, the easy way, it's a good start, but it's not enough. When we get to functors, an array will be our way in, but it won't be enough. And so if you look from the left, you can see everything to the left of zero, the slope is negative one. Everything to the right of zero, the slope is positive one. And now we get to that issue where the limit from the left doesn't equal the limit from the right. And so the limit doesn't exist. The derivative at x equals zero doesn't exist. All of a sudden, we need these more 
complicated, these more formal ideas. At the end of the semester in a calculus class, one of my favorite things is writing everything they've learned on the blackboard. And everything we've learned over an entire semester painstakingly with examples and graphs and formulas can be condensed to just this much. And that's what happens with all of our learning. If you think of what it took for you to understand all these concepts in functional programming, it took quite a while, but now that you know it, it's compact in your head and you see these connections where all you need to know is the chain rule or the quotient rule. And that's enough to trigger that you can put all these things together. So that's us with functional programming. Now, I mentioned that I use Swift. There are people in functional programming that roll their eyes at this. Fortunately, there was a talk yesterday where the talk said, what do you need for a functional language? And the answer was, well, ergonomics are better in some languages than other, but there's actually very little that you need for a language to be considered functional. And yet I know some people don't consider Swift to be necessarily a functional language, but you can do functional programming in it. So there are functional practices that we can follow. And there's nothing in the language that forces us to behave. And yet you're becoming, we're coming to the point where people will say that that's very Swifty code, that that's more Swift-like. And one of the things that's driving it is our new UI, Swift UI. So even though Swift doesn't have support for some of the things that you might consider essential, like lazy evaluation or partial application or currying, you can do functional programming in Swift. I think of this with the bicycle. Last year, I decided I was very out of shape and I needed to get back on my bicycle. And so instead of driving to places, I should bike there. And so I took out my bicycle. And after using it for a couple of months, I decided to buy an electric bicycle. And I felt so guilty because an electric bicycle, it's not a real bicycle. I'm not really biking. It's, it's helping me along with the motor. As I pedal, it gives me an extra kick. You know, functional programming is functional programming. Swift isn't a functional language. And yet what I found when I looked back was in the first four months of last summer, I biked 80 miles. And once I had my electric bike, I biked 600 miles. So even though each mile might've been a little easier, it wasn't that factor easier. And now I'm more likely to get on the bike to go meet a friend for coffee or go do my grocery shopping or go visit my in-laws. So that extra push uh, got me on the bike in the same way that using Swift. Swift is the language I use. I'm writing apps for the iPhone. And so even though Swift might not be considered a functional language by some people, it's the language in my pocket. It's like the iPhone is the camera in my pocket. And so I'm gonna do more with functional programming because Swift is the language that I, that I use. One of the things driving us in this direction is Swift UI. And so uh, here's how we might create something using Swift UI. It's a little button component. And so I'm gonna create a button that has an image on it. So the button will have text and an image. And so if you have a button, a button has two things that you need. Now in Swift UI, a button is a value type. It is immutable. And so we're making this, this nod towards doing the right thing, at least from a, a functional perspective. We're creating these things very inexpensively and we're not muta mutating them, we're throwing them out. A button needs to do two things. It needs to know what it looks like, what is it displaying, and it needs to know what it does when it's tapped. And so I have to input that. So here's the text and the symbol name that I'm entering. And that's what will be displayed. And here's the action it will perform. And this for many in Swift is the magical moment because all of a sudden they realize that a function and a string can both be properties. And this is obvious to people in functional programming, but to people that come from this OO world, from a Swift world, this is very new. And so like tangent lines in calculus, we have this very fundamental, easy idea. And one of the most easy and important ideas in functional programming is that functions aren't special. Now, we tend to say functions are first-class objects, but 
the fact that you can treat a function the same way you would treat a string or an int and you can store it in a property, that's a big step for some people. So let's render our button. Here's what I want it to look like. And so in Swift UI, the way I do that is I conform to view and I implement the uh, body. And so here's my button and my button constructor, there's several, I'm using the one that takes an action and a label. And the action is a function and the label is a function. So here is a constructor that accepts as its parameters two functions. And this again is something new. Now we've been talking about map and filter in Swift for years, but a lot of people haven't made that leap to where it's very natural to pass a function in. And so my action in this case, I'm passing in as that property name that was passed to me. And for the label, I'm constructing a label using that text and that symbol name. And in, in Swift, uh, we, we tend to use trailing enclosures to make this a little cleaner. And so instead of using that label, we can just use this as a trailing enclosure. And so this is very typical Swift UI code. So Swift and Swift UI has driven many people that never would have thought of functional programming in the direction of functional programming. There's the immutability, there's the first class function, there's the higher order functions. And so let's stay with the higher order functions and let's return to arrays because once we understand higher order functions in Swift UI, maybe we'll reconsider what people have been telling us for years about using them in arrays. So I had this collection here, this array of ints. And I took this collection and I filtered it. And I filtered it saying, you give me an int. And if the int is a multiple of two, I return true and I keep it in my collection. And so filter returns a new array with just the even numbers in it. And once I have those, I can further process it. And so I know folks from Haskell work the other direction, but here, I like this because it looks like a bulleted list. I take a collection, I filter it, I take the results of that and I map them. And so I have even numbers. So I might as well take those even numbers and divide them by two. And so I will get back one and two in my final array. And the point is that inside of this closure for the map, I have a function that starts with an int and returns an int. And so the map of F takes an array of ints and returns an array of ints. Again, very natural to us. If we instead have an array of strings, then my map will take a string and, and do something with strings. In this case, I have a function that takes a string and returns the count, it returns an int. So the map of F is taking an array of strings and returning an array of ints. And the fact that we can transform and produce a new array this is new to many people, but array is, is our entry point into it. And we're starting with those smooth functions. We're starting with the easy cases like we do in calculus. And we look at our closures and in Swift, instead of doing string and string count, we can use our dollar zero placeholders for the first parameter, or we can use key paths. And we can just say words.map using slash dot count. And all of a sudden, it's very readable, it's very natural. We, we know what we're doing with these things. So we learn map for array. And it's as if I give you this question. I've drawn this for you. Here is y equals f of x for x less than x naught. What happens to the right? How would you continue this graph? Now, there are many ways to continue it. I would expect that most of you would do something like this because that's a nice smooth graph and, and that's what we're used to. Now we'll return and look at other cases, but this is the array. It says, start your understanding with something concrete that you know. Start with arrays, start with dictionaries, start with sets. These all are similar. And so filter and map and reduce and all these higher order functions uh, exist in collections, it's very natural for us. Now, where we're headed is by the end of the talk, we're going to get away from these things that are essentially containers. And that's another huge jump. But for now, the huge jump is 
if I give you this and I tell you to continue the graph, there's nothing that says you couldn't have put an angle in it and continued it this way. Nothing said that the graph had to be smooth. And yet in our head, we tend to gravitate towards the nice examples. So the next thing that comes up for us in, in Swift is optionals, or you might think of it as a, as a maybe type. In Swift, an optional is implemented as an enum. It is generic and wrapped. And there are two cases. Either I've got a value, in which case it's wrapped inside of the sum case, or it's nil, in which case it's formally the none case. So we informally talk about this as the nil case. And so that's an optional. And so just as we had an array of strings and we could use map there, I'm gonna give you a, a kind of a dumb example and we're gonna do map for optionals as well. And what's interesting is most people in Swift never reach for an optional uh, map in fact, many don't know that a map exists for optionals, so it's hard for them to generalize on this. So I have a possible word. I have an optional string, which we, we write more like this, a string with a question mark. And so that's an optional string. Uh, I'll let it be nil just for ease, and I'll use that same function count. And it looks like I'm using the same function map, but this is map for optional, not map for arrays. And so map for optional takes a nil to a nil. And for a non-nil, it reaches inside, transforms the thing using count, and then wraps it back up in an optional. So count is a function from string to int. So the map of f in this case is a function from an optional string to an optional int. Now, those of us that have been here for a while, we see these connections right away, but they aren't easy to make. An array doesn't feel anything like an optional. And so we put this in our list. We have an array, a dictionary, a set, and now an optional. And we let that sit with people so they can see that working with handbrakes is just a detail. It's different than coaster brakes, but a bicycle is still a bicycle. I still essentially ride it the same way. I just have to think of the details a little differently when it's time for me to stop. So here's another question for you. I'm only giving you the value at x naught. And I ask you, create any function, y equals f of x, passing through that designated point. This is a big moment. When I ask you to create a type that accepts a map, that's a big moment. So first we learn by looking at map for array and map for optional, and now it's time for us to create one. And so we have to see the need. We have to see why that would help us. And so this is a huge step for people. So as an example, I want to look at magic hat. And so I have a magic hat. A magic hat contains exactly one item. So it's not like an optional where it can contain something or nothing. A magic hat contains something, exactly one item. So it's a struct. It is generic in contents. And it contains contents, which is of that type contents. Now, contents could be an int. Contents could be an array of ints. Contents can be a string. It can be a bike. It can be anything you want. We're generic in contents. And so I can make one that contains an int. Here's 17. It's a magic hat whose contents are 17. That's a magic hat, generic and int. And what's inside of it is the number 17. So what should map do for magic hat? If I have a function from int to something else, then the map should go from a magic hat of ints to a magic hat of that something else. Or as we say it, if f is a function from a to b, then the map of f is a function from the magic hat generic in a to the magic hat generic in b. Now, if we think too much about magic and we think about a magic hat sitting on the stage and a rabbit turns into a, a scarf or something or a pigeon, uh, then we forget that actually we're creating a new magic hat and it will have something of type B in it. So we're, we're not only swapping what's under the magic hat, we're actually swapping the magic hats and that's the immutability. 
Now, once someone has been motivated this way, you can ask them to write map and they can generally figure it out. They've seen map for array, for optional and for other types. And so they know that it has to be generic and whatever the target type is. I need that F, that transform that takes whatever my type is to that other type. And I'm gonna end up with a magic hat containing that other type. And to implement it, I know that I have to create a magic hat containing B and all I have to tell you is what are the contents? And the contents are what I get when I apply that transform to the current contents. And again, you've done this for years. It's very natural to you. It's a big moment when someone can do this for themselves. So it's, it's like, for those of you that have kids, it's like that moment where you relive the things that you loved as a kid by looking at the joy in your child's eyes, when they do something for themselves, when they make their own lunch for themselves, when they ride their own bike, when they do something all by themselves, it's a big moment. And watching the joy in someone, instead of saying, well, that was easy and obvious, it's, it's wonderful what they've done. Now we can use our new map. I have this magic hat that contains the number 17. And so I can take 17 and I can map it using a method that I've created, which is I have a deck of cards. And so a card has a rank and a suit and a deck is just an array of those things. And I'm just gonna count down so many positions and give you the card at that position. And if I have more positions than cards, I just get to the end and I start again. And so my card from the fresh deck I'm getting the magic hat that has 17 in it and I'm replacing it with the card, which turns out to be the five of diamonds. So what should map do for magic hat? I had card for fresh from fresh deck, which took an inst and mapped it to a card. And so the map of the card from fresh deck took a magic hat containing an int and gave me back a magic hat containing a card. Still containers but now you've written your own. You've taken this huge step of creating your own type that has a map. You've written your own bicycle. Now these examples provide context and allow you to learn new things. And so Apple came along a few years ago and they introduced something called Combine and Combine was their functional reactive framework. And it looks like they're, they're now phasing it out in favor of an async await and all the friends that go with it. But at the time combined had publishers, <coughs> excuse me, and subscribers and ways of connecting to them. So these were pipelines from publisher to subscriber and our maps and our filters in between took one publisher and converted it into another publisher. So I have an example where I write a rock, paper, scissors application. And when you hit go, you choose rock, paper, scissors, and you get a response either from the computer or we do a network version. Uh, so we get rock, paper, scissors, and then you see your result. So you're choosing rock, paper, scissors. That's a hand position. And so I have a hand class. And inside the hand class, it has the hand position. And that's rock, paper, scissors. And as that is set, either by you pushing a button or by the machine, I'm gonna publish that result. And so this is a publisher of hand positions. Now, like the result type, publishers have a success, they have an output type and they have a failure type. And in this case, I'm publishing a hand position and I can never fail. There's never an error. It's a detail, but for this type, you have to have an initial value. So initially I'm gonna publish a rock. Now, what I'd like to do is take that publisher of hand positions that never fails and somehow transform it into a publisher of strings that never fails so that I can display it on the screen. I can get the string that re represents the image name and I can display it on the screen. And as soon as you see something like that, you can hear the need for a map. And so we're adding to our array, our dictionary, our set, our optional, the result type we mentioned, the one you created, publishers also have a map. And because of your experience using and creating other maps, you're very familiar with this one. And so you say, I wanna create this image name that is a publisher of strings that never fails. I'm gonna start now this dollar hand position 
that is the publisher of hand positions that never fails. I start with a hand position, publisher of hand positions that never fails. It's initially rocks, so I throw out the first one. That's still a publisher of hand position that never fails. And now I want to convert it to a publisher of strings that never fails. And I can do that using a map. And from my hand position, I asked for the image name using this key path. Now it's a technical detail, but the actual type of this is this nasty mess of nested uh, generics. And so uh, we, use type erasure to clean this up to any publisher and that will get easier and swift. But I've highlighted the main two pieces, the drop first and the erase to any publisher are details. The real thing I want you to concentrate on is we had a publisher, excuse me, we had a publisher of hand positions that never failed and we've converted it to a publisher of strings that never failed. So I want to complicate the setup because I want to look at possibly throwing an error. And I want to do that because we've been looking at map and I want to look at flat map as well. So I'm doing this for no reason except to motivate this example. And so instead of picking a hand position, I'm going to pick an integer between one and a hundred. And if it's divisible by 10, I'll throw an error. So this is, is completely made up so that I can throw an error. And if I don't throw an error, I will take the integer mod three and assign it to rock, paper, or scissors. So I have a situation now where an error could be thrown. And I want to show you the first attempt. I start with a publisher of ints that never fails. I drop the first because I had to have an initial value for it. So that's still a publisher of ints that never fails. Now, restricted position can throw an error so instead of map in combined, they have us use try map. And this gives me a publisher of hand positions that can throw an error. It can throw a divisible by 10 error. And if I throw an error, then combined says, I should catch the error. So I've caught an error. I wanna come up with some hand position I can give you, but then my types don't match. If my try map was successful, I'm returning a publisher of hand positions. If it's not successful, right now I'm just returning a hand position. So I have to wrap that random hand position inside a publisher of hand positions. And I do that with something called just. Now in your language, you may have just or unit or ID. It's a way of taking an element and embedding it in the, in the monad. And so if I have just five and I'm in the world of arrays, then I get an array that contains only the number five. So just random hand position takes my random hand position. It publishes just that random hand position. And then it says, I'm done. I'm not going to publish anything else. So the nice thing is the types match up. I end up with my publisher of what I want, but the first time a number that's divisible by 10 pops through, then restricted position throws an error, try map re-throws the error, I end up inside of this just, and I'm done. So as soon as I hit my first multiple of 10, I get a random hand position, and then my, my process stops. I don't get any more hand positions. My game is over. So I'd like to be able to keep going after I hit my first multiple of 10. So let's wrap my try map and my catch inside of something. And so because int dollar int and drop first, these are publishers of hand positions that never fail. What comes into my closure is going to be an int. It's streaming in from the top. So I want to somehow connect that to my try map so I take my int, my five, and I put it inside of a publisher. And now just int publishes that five that came in. And five falls into try map and catch and so on. So what is that question mark thing that is on the outside of this closure? What is the operator that I'm using? If I look inside, the shape of the inside is it's a function that takes an int and returns a publisher of a hand position that never fails. 
If it was a function from int to hand position, I would use a map. But if I use a map, the problem is I get a publisher of a publisher. I've double wrapped it. I've taken the inside, which gives me back a publisher of hand positions that never fails, and map takes that int and wraps it inside of a publisher, and I get a publisher of a publisher. And as all of you know, this is calling out for, instead of that, oops, going the wrong way, sorry. Instead of map, a flat map. Flat map will flatten this out. So I go from upstream, a publisher of ints that never fails to a publisher of hand position that never fails. And what's nice is every time I get a new int, I get something out of this. And the just is inside of my flat map. And so the next int that gets published from upstream pops in, something will always come out of the inside of my flat map. And so this is uh, this is a way we can handle errors in combine. We keep going after the error is thrown. We've looked at things with map, things with flat map include arrays and dictionaries and sets and optionals and results and publishers and maybe something that you create. And so if I look back at introductory calculus, I now have map and I have flat map. In introductory calculus, I have these two operators, these higher order functions, and the derivative takes a function and returns a function, and the integral takes a function that returns a function. And it turns out the fundamental theorem of calculus relates the two. So once we have map and we have flat map, Another big moment in the lives of people coming to this world is seeing how they connect to each other. And I'm just going to use arrays to illustrate. Suppose I have a function from string to int. And I'm working towards a function g from string to an array of ints, but it's a very specific function. I want g to be what I would get if I take f and take a string and produce an int, and then I use just to take that int and embed it into an array of ints. So G takes a string and returns an array of ints that contains a single int. So what happens if I map F? If I map F, I've lifted that to a function map F from an array of strings to an array of ints. And what happens if I map G? I lift that to a function from an array of strings to an array array of ints. And as soon as I see that, I think, uh-oh, what I really want is to flat map G. And once we have this diagram, it motivates our understanding to see that the flat map of G is the same thing as the flat map of doing F followed by just. And that's just the map of F. In other words, as soon as we have a flat map and adjust, we automatically have a map and all these things that we were taught were hard in category theory kind of fall out of this. So roughly like smooth curves, there's something similar about all these types of map. And there's something similar about all these types of flat map and a type with flat map and just always has a map. And there's some fine print about map and flat map. Now, I give you this curve, missing the point at x naught, and I ask you to complete the point. And I understand that many people would fill in that dot, but I want to point out that any of those points, any of those purple points is a valid answer. And there's many more messy answers than clean answers. So even though we think of graphs as functions as being continuous curves and smooth and well-behaved, they aren't. There's many more bad curves than nice curves. When we think of map and flat map, we think of these types. We think of containers. And that's because of the context we've learned them in. And so I might have a container of A's, and I want to produce a container of B's. And you know how to do that. You pull something out of the container, you map it over, and you place it in the container. And once you've done it, You've taken your container A and, and you produce your container B. But what if it's not a container? For example, the reader. The reader doesn't contain anything except a function. And the function goes from something we think of as the environment to A. 
So this reader monad, which tells us, oh, it's got map, it's got flat map, it's got just. Now we forget what it's like not to know something. This is a huge step. And we try to build on what we know from Magic Hat and do this algorithmically. We use our formula. This is what we did for Magic Hat. So could we do the same thing for reader? If I had to transform from A to B, how do I get from a reader EA to a reader EB? And the answer is I'm gonna to have to do some sort of a composition. Then I'm gonna to have to take this F from E to A and use the transform to get that A to B. And now I'll get an F from E to B. So my map takes that function from A to B to produce a reader from E to B. And so I get my reader from E to B by using my transform on F. So if F goes from E to B, then I got my composition. Now let's use reader. Uh, so sorry to interrupt. Uh, just a time check around five minutes to go. Less than okay. Minutes. Yeah. So I use my reader. Let's produce um, an example with the deck of cards. And so a card has a rank ace through king and a suit. And a deck is an array of cards. And so in this case, I have the 17th card. And so I've got my E and my A and my F to fill in. My E is my context is a deck. My A is a card. And my function says, get me the 17th card. You give me a deck and I'll produce the 17th card. Now I won't know the deck till later on. So let's play. I take my 17th card. I use my map to take my card and return a rank. I use my map to take my rank and return a string. So now this thing took a reader deck and card and transformed into a reader of a deck and string. I can try it with different decks. If I use a fresh deck, I get the five of diamonds. If I use face cards, I get the king of diamonds. And so notice what's different is we passed in this F at the end. We passed in the environment at the end. This is a huge step. You're building up this context thing and then adding the specific instance that we're in later. Now, what if we wanted the next card? If we want the next card, that depends on the deck and we don't know the deck yet. So we have to somehow work with a deck that we don't know about. And we don't know which card we're on yet because that depends on the deck. So here's a helper function for next card. Notice its shape, it takes a card and returns a reader of a deck card. As soon as you see that, you feel flat map. And so somehow I have to return a reader and my function that I produce in reader, because that's the only thing reader needs is that function from E to A, it's got to go from deck to card. And so my deck to card says, if the card isn't in the deck, just return the first card. And if it is in the deck, return the next card. And now we can use it. We take the 17th card and we flat map it. And that gives us a reader of deck card. And it depends which deck we pass in. The environment gets passed in last. It's not a co container that contains all the things ahead of time. So for the fresh deck, we get the six of diamonds. And for the face cards, we get the jack of clubs. That's the card after the king of diamonds. And that's the reader monad. State is similar. It's also not a container. The difference is that instead of it being from E to A, it's from E to A and E again. We're, we're modifying it. And since we want to think of E as not being the environment, but the state, we use the letters S instead. And so let's deal from our deck. And to deal from the deck, we return a tuple, the top card, and the remaining cards in the deck. So I have my S, which is my deck, my A, which is my card. And I'll create an instance of state. My dealer will be the, the state that I create using this function. This is my function from S to AS. So the dealer can deal cards like this. I ask it to run and it returns a card and the rest of the deck. Now this is a pain in the neck because to get the next card, you have to pass in the deck you just returned, the one without the top card on it. And this is kind of exhausting and annoying. Fortunately, we have map and flat map. 
What MAP allows me to do is to say, this is an example for dealing cards, but I could use it to flip coins. If I get a red card, I'll call it heads. If I get a black card, I'll call it tails. And now I make my coin flipper from my dealer and I run it. Now notice I'm still getting a deck back, but my A is my coin. So map converted the A, but not the S. So that, that was the map for state. Uh, just quickly to show you the implementation. Again, if I have a function from A to B and I want to end up with a state, I need that run function. And so the run function says, you give me an S and I give you back an A and an S. Well, in this case, it's a B and an S because I'm transforming it. When I run it, I get an A and an S, and then I use the transform to get it to be a B and an S. So this is exhausting. I'd like to be able to deal five cards at once or N cards at once. So if I have my dealer, I'd like to say, give me the first five cards. And it gives me the first five cards. And if I want to keep going, then I take the deck, which is what remains after I've dealt the first five cards off of it, and I deal the next five cards. So what is this next? It feels like what we did with handling errors and combined. It's like the next card with reader. I say how many cards I want, and I build up an accumulator, and I start it with an empty deck of cards. And inside, I'm going to flat map because of the shape of this function, which says, you give me A, and I'll make sure that I haven't used all the count that I need. If I've used all the count that I need, I'll give you my accumulator. Otherwise, I'm going to recur. Otherwise, I'm going to pick another card, add it to my set of cards that I'm going to return in my accumulator, and I decrease by one. I need the flat map because of the shape of the function inside. I'm not going to show you flat map for state or reader. I just want to point out that as we ventured into the world of these monads into these states, we had these hard points. We had generics. You forget because you're so smart and so experienced, but new people who are also smart, just not experienced, generics, functions as first-class objects, map, concrete examples, these are all new to them. And each step is hard. At the end, we can combine it onto the single slide. We saw patterns, we created our own functor, we made the leap to flat map, we understood the connection between map and flat map, and we felt we really understood containers, and so we took this final leap into reader and state. It's hard. We forget that riding a bicycle is hard. We forget what it's like not to know something. Thank you. That was an amazing, amazing, inspiring, very inspiring session. Thank you, uh, Daniel. So uh, we have uh, Aditya that says hot take. If uh, you do F, uh, from FP right, you get OOP for free and vice versa. I think that's dead on. I, I, I know people get very religious about that, but I think that if you do, what you see mainly from FP people who take on OOP people is they take the worst cases and oh, people who take on, it's the same thing. But if you're doing either one right, you're factoring into these small, reusable, testable components. And so I, I completely agree that at the end, we end up the same place in many ways. Right, uh, so we also have a comment from Nilesh who says, really liked how it turned, uh, started from the basics of FP to reactive form of FP. And then- Thank you. Uh, Leap says, uh, this is a reactive approach with elements and other operators are, uh, are used to transform the elements. That's exactly right. And yeah. so in, in combine, and I assume that's when they were talking, in combine, the map and the filter are called operators. So it's exactly, it's exactly the same. Um, Swift's combine comes from um, reactive streams. So that's the Java library that they derive from. Great. Uh, right. So yeah, Aditya also shared uh, uh, some uh, something here. Uh, generalizing out of container context is giving me lots of transdu transducer wipes now, or maybe that's because I spent several sleepless nights on it. And I, I, I wish we had transducers in Swift. I think Clojure has them and it makes things so much nicer. And so I wish we had those there. 
the cheeky signature of a transducer is uh, whatever input, whatever, go, gives whatever input, whatever. And then there's the link that he shared. Right, so yeah, and yeah, it, um, closures are the poor man's objects after all. That's from Aditya. <laughs> Thank you all. This this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Great, great comments. Ho hopefully, we'll be there in person again. <laughs>